putting variability in the actual foundations of physics. This preliminary is basically to drive home the enormity of what I'm about to suggest here, which is that it could be that the universe, at least in some extreme circumstances, like the Big Bang, a black hole, so something quite extreme, could be that the universe makes it up as it goes along. So things maybe are not as fixed, not as set in stone, as they taught us in school, as we like to see the law of physics to be. So this may sound completely crazy, but actually the pedigree is quite respectable. As far as I know, it goes down to this famous quote by John Wheeler, famous physicist, where this higgledy-piggledy uh, quote, the universe came into being in a big bang, before which Einstein's theory instructs us there was no before. Not only particles and fields of force had to come into being at the Big Bang, but the laws of physics themselves, and this by a process as eagledy piggledy as genetic mutation or the second law of thermodynamics. So the idea here is that, of course, as the world comes into being, it's not just a transformation from nothing to existing, it's the laws themselves have to come into existence. And the process may be something which supersedes the idea of a well-defined, fixed uh, law. Evolution could be something like genetic mutation, selection, etc., etc. So it's very interesting, but of course, you know, the devil is always in the details, and this is what I will be talking about. And so why do physicists react so strongly about this idea? John Wheeler was quite respected, but in a way, this view is quite minority still. And um, the reason is because what is at stake is really quite stunning. So you might say, why not the lost change? Well, in fact, what is at stake is a violation of one of the most sacrosanct principles in physics, which is the law of conservation of energy. So the idea that nothing is created, things change, but they don't actually get created, they just transform into different forms of energy. So again, you might say, well, this is nothing surprising. This is like saying you get a free lunch when you change the laws. Well, that's called corruption, right? So it's actually very common in the human beings. But as I said, we really think the human, the, the world out there is very different from the human world. Okay, so let me kind of get into the details. The devil is in the details, but the details are really interesting. The devil is interesting, basically. So this goes back to this lady, Amy Noder, a mathematician, who at the beginning of the last century proved something quite remarkable. So um, people already knew this difference between invariances of symmetries in the world and invariances of symmetries in the laws of the world. So obviously, as the example I gave, if a meteorite hit the Earth, the mass would change, but the laws of nature wouldn't change, right? So, so one thing is the invariances of the physical world, the other thing is the invariances of the laws. And what she proved is a remarkable mathematical theorem with some caveats, with some ifs and buts, but what she proved was that for each invariance in the laws of physics, there is a conserved quantity. So in other words, for example, the fact that um, the laws of physics are the same here and in London just means that, for example, the momentum is conserved. This quantity called linear momentum is conserved. So things that the fact that the laws are the same in every direction, there's a quantity called angular momentum that's conserved. Every time you find a symmetry, you find a conserved quantity. And she found a very nice mathematical way to actually derive from the symmetry what is the conserved quantity. So this is very interesting. If you know, what you're questioning now is the history of the laws of physics. Are they something which doesn't have a history, it's always the same? Or are they something which changes? And again, this is something we do know the law the universe itself is a time invariance that's broken. So Einstein thought the universe was static, but then it was disabused by observations quite dramatically by the theory of the Big Bang. So there is a Big Bang, the universe is expanding, the universe is evolving, but the fact that you have a variation in the actual world, could it be that this also signal a variation in the laws of physics itself in time as the universe comes out of this Big Bang event, which is quite dramatic? Okay? So what Noda's theorem does, is actually quite remarkable, is relate this time invariance of physics with energy conservation. So this is what is at stake. You basically violate one, you violate the other. And this is why people get a bit, you know, a bit tangled and upset and so on, physicists. So this is considered to be quite a dramatic thing to do. 
So what is at stake is remarkable, as I said. But on the other hand, you have a chance of matter energy being created out of nothing, if this actually were to be what happened. So it could be that this is actually the origin of the Big Bang, of the self-creation of the universe. And it could also be interesting because maybe, I don't know, this is one thing I will mention later, could be the origin of matter we know is out there, but we can't see it. And I'll talk a bit about this towards the end. There's a bunch of things called dark matter or dark matters, depending on what you mean exactly, because we feel their pull. So there is something there, we can't see it. What is it? Maybe this whole puzzle, this whole puzzle of the Big Bang, all these things are connected. Okay, so let's get into the details. Um, so first of all, if the laws do change, what does change about them? It's the first thing, I mean, let's be more detailed about this. And then, of course, here we have the proverbial Pandora box. I mean, if once you allow variability, there is an embarrassment of riches. It's basically, you know, it's the usual story about a cat and a non-cat. There's only one way to be a cat. It can be all kinds of animals like a crocodile or a lion, etc. So there's many ways in which you can introduce variability once you go beyond um, the dogma of the constancy of the laws. But one possibility, and this is the one I'm going to explore here, is those concerned concerning the constants of nature. So this is something which appears, for example, Newton's law of universal attraction. We're all attracted to each other. This is not a facetious statement. It's basically the universe. All the masses attract each other. And what Newton stated is that this force of gravity is proportional to the masses, the more the mass, the more the attraction, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So if you have twice as far, you're a quarter of the attraction. We have a quarter of the attraction. So when you state something like this, proportional, means there is a proportionality constant, okay? And this is exactly, in this case, Newton's gravitational constant, and this is how physics gets completely embedded into these constants of nature, which are supposed to be universal. You're framing a law of physics, and you get a constant somewhere in the formulation of this law. So variability could be more or less dramatic. I mean, of course, I could go to Newton's law and say something like, maybe in the past, instead of going like the square, I went like the cube of distance. It to be quite dramatic. But something which is perhaps less dramatic, and which I'm going to explore here, is exactly whether or not this Newton's constant, this proportionality constant, was actually variable in time. So this is again, this is going to be a talk of quotations. This is again something which goes back to Dirac, very interesting physicist. Um, let me read this as well. I think you can probably read it in the back. But So Dirac is famous for saying this, which is a paper he wrote in 1930-something, which started the field. One field of work in which there has been too much speculation is cosmology. There are very few hard facts to go on. The theoretical workers have been busy constructing various models for the universe based on any assumptions that they fancy. These models are probably all wrong. But Iraq was famous for being quite blunt, okay? It is usually assumed that the laws of nature have always been the same as they are now. There is no justification for this. The laws may be changing and in particular quantities which are considered to be constants of nature may be varying with cosmological time. Such variations would completely upset the model makers. Very interesting quote, and you see the difference he makes, he draws between variability in the constants and in the laws themselves. He was well aware of Noda's theorem, obviously. So he's kind, of, he's kind of a dramatic quote, and he's really started off this field of variability in the laws through the variabilities in the constants. So it's something which is not widely known. He actually, Dirac wrote this paper, I said 1930-something, 1937. He wrote it during his honeymoon. It's not on record what um, his wife thought all about this. It was in Brighton. What is on record is what Niels Bohr said. Look what happens to people when they get married. <laughs> uh, Niels Bohr, of course, was married and had five kids. So, but anyway, that's a different issue. So anyway, this was for a long time a bit, was not very respectable. I mean, by the time we get to John Wheeler, which is later, this kind of was started to make it into the mainstream of science, but I wouldn't say even nowadays is mainstream, it's just a bit of a crazy idea. Now, having said this, when you say constants of nature, they're quite different and can classify them in many different ways. For example, the Newton's gravitational constant is like a, it's an interaction strength, it's the strength of gravity. 
Now, there are things like the speed of light, Planck's constant, etc., which are structural. So they're really much more foundational. They really go into like the whole foundations of the physics constructions. So it's not very surprising that when you go into varying constant theories, the first ones really explore the ones that did least damage, like particularly Newton's constant, the electric charge was another one. Changing varying speed of light was, you know, so I was involved in this, um, obviously doing quite serious damage to the usual framework of physics, but this is why I thought it was interesting, because you're actually uh, putting variability in the actual foundations of physics at a, a much obvious level than these other possibilities. So this is what I say here, if you do something like that, well, you're more likely to signal an actual variability in the laws. You're also more likely to be labeled a punk rocker of physics. This comes from new scientists, actually. This is the kind of expression they use um, to label our work, which I thought it was funny. In fact, the only thing I can add is that the first varying speed of light theory I'm aware of was proposed by Einstein himself. Okay? So if you want to call Einstein a punk rocker of physics, that's fine by me. But in 1911, he was the first, as far as I know. Uh, it actually goes back to Kelvin, Lord Kelvin, the 80s, 70s, something. He didn't produce a theory, but he did ask the question uh, whether the speed of light could vary. So anyway, these things have been around. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.